Since we've last met, there's certainly been a lot of newsworthy items that we could probably spend the next three hours discussing. Um, many of them, of course, have directly been related to the focus of what we are considering um, over the course of this year, the road to the White House, the march towards the election on November the 3rd, 2020. But what began as a campaign that was going to pit an incumbent, hopefully running on a three and a half to four year record against a challenger from the out of power party, in this case, um, the Democratic Party, has now become a race focused on the coronavirus and the effects of COVID-19 and many different ancillary issues associated um, with that subject. In a little bit, we are going to examine what truly has been a great American conundrum. That being the interrelated issues of health care, availability of health care, the costs of health care, and how in a country with the values and mores and ethos that make the United States separate and distinct from just about every other developed country around the world, how is health care viewed vis-a-vis -vis average citizens and the availability of it um, to average citizens. We recognize, of course, that throughout our history, something we talked about earlier this year, the United States uniquely has been a country that has been in love, stuck with a two-party system and just a two-party system. So even though the parties have had different names and the parties have stood for different things in the past on the important issues of the day, generally speaking, when Americans go to select their leaders, not just at the presidential level, but we recognize at the state and local level as well, we are frequently offered a binary choice, A or B, vanilla or chocolate. And we've seen, certainly in the last 20 years, a hardening of the partisanship within the ranks of both Democrats and Republicans, oftentimes making it very difficult to find consensus, to use that dreaded, ugly C word, compromise, in order to fashion solutions to important issues that often require the give and take and bargaining and negotiation that often is considered part of a democratic um, political process. We've seen issues ranging from immigration to the national debt to deficits and indeed, of course, to health care become so entrenched ideologically in this great left-right divide that we as a nation live in politically, that COVID-19, coronavirus, things like wearing a mask. I don't know if the blue side goes out or the white side goes out. I'm never really sure about that. But even wearing masks have become something that, of course, has split along this great partisan rift. So more about that in, in a moment. We are now in um, the month of August, and depending on when you are viewing this presentation, um, one or both of the party conventions um, have already taken place. Now, if you recall just a blink of an eye to 2016, we were in a very different um, configuration politically at that time. Barack Obama had served two terms as president. He could not run for another term. So no matter who prevailed in 2016, we were going to have a brand new president. There was no incumbent.
So in July of 2016, both parties held their nominating conventions. Now, by that time, um, among Republicans, Donald Trump had literally come out of nowhere, out of Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue in, in New York City, um, to dispatch a field of almost 15 Republicans, many of them professional politicians who had been climbing the ladder of political success. All through early 2016, we saw Jeb Bush, Chris Christie, Ben Carson, um, Ted Cruz, <clears throat> Marco Rubio, all step aside as Donald Trump clinched the Republican nomination in April of 2016, preparing, of course, for July when the Republican convention would meet um, in Cleveland to formalize his nomination. Now, at the same time, among Democrats, President Obama's vice president, Joe Biden, someone who logically and historically might have been the person to pass the baton to as the next Democratic presidential nominee, chose not to seek the party's nomination, largely because he was still grieving following the death of his son, um, Bo Biden, I think about a year before. So the Democratic field became a less crowded one, Hillary Clinton versus Bernie Sanders, but the battle was a highly pitched one, Clinton representing a more traditional centrist Democratic view towards all the important issues of the day, um, while Bernie Sanders, like he did last year and earlier this year, found more left of center, big government, progressive solutions to most of the important issues of the day. And it wasn't until actually May that Hillary Clinton managed to secure enough delegates to clinch the nomination on um, her behalf and then waited for that day in Philadelphia in late July when she would become the formal nominee of the Democratic Party. So the Republicans met in Cleveland. And again, an old, rousing, um, rancorous, uh, old-style convention. Convention halls packed, you know, like sardines with loyal Republicans from every part of the country. Packed so close that you could, you know, smell the alcohol on the breath of the person next to you or the perfume or the cologne that the person standing or sitting next to you was wearing. Speeches were given. Eventually, most of the candidates that um, Donald Trump defeated on the way to the Republican nomination, some grudgingly, gave speeches endorsing his nomination. Um, more um, um, rancorous Trump supporters, Rudy Giuliani, um, a rousing speech. Um, retired General Michael Flynn leading the crowd in chants of lock her up, lock her up at the convention. And of course, lots of yells to build that wall and who was going to pay for it. Again, resonating among Republicans those important issues that Donald Trump had successfully brought to the fore during his rush to the campaign nomination. When the Democrats met, Bernie Sanders was not completely yet on board with Hillary Clinton's nomination. And in reality, that convention was the more um, rambunctious one and, and the one which took a few days before there was some display of, of unity where the party had been unified and Bernie Sanders was firmly uh, behind Hillary Clinton. Of course, Barack Obama, the president leaving office, gave a speech, as did his wife, Michelle Obama, as did Joe Biden, as did Bernie Sanders, as did former President Bill Clinton, speaking, of course, now on behalf of his wife, who was the Democratic nominee for president. 
And of course, Bill Clinton gave a speech um, emblematic of, of his great skills, um, tearing up. You know, you see it coming, that great skill. The rim of the eye gets red, starts blinking, and then tears come down his eyes. A great political skill if you think about it. George W. Bush never cried in office. Barack Obama, Donald Trump, forget about it. Ronald Reagan could. He was an actor. He knew the tricks, I guess. But Bill Clinton had that rare talent, his eyes welling up and crying. Um, maybe he bit his lip, maybe he had rocks in his shoes, who knew his secret, but that was on display in Philadelphia when Hillary Clinton won the nomination. So the conventions ended, and then by late August, early September, the general election phase of the campaign began. Donald Trump continuing these loud rallies, large crowds, fervently supportive, traveling, doggedly through all of the important battleground states. Hillary Clinton running a more traditional campaign, talking about expanding the political map, going down to Texas and Arizona, states she hoped to turn blue in November, not making one trip to Wisconsin. That was in the bag, Democrats always won Wisconsin, barely traveling much to Michigan, giving some attention to, to Pennsylvania. So we know what happened. On election day, Donald Trump stunned the world. Um, for the second time, really, winning the Republican nomination was a tremendous feat in and of itself, but winning the presidency in his first run for elective office was a rare feat in, in American um, presidential history. And of course, January 20th, 2017, Donald Trump took the oath of office as president of the United States. This year began as one where we began assessing what were going to be the important issues that voters were going to consider as they made their way towards um, nominating primaries and caucuses and eventually towards um, election day. And then of course, by March, as our meetings live and in person were, were being interrupted, so was much of the commerce, um, much of the travel, and much of the traditional style campaigning that we've come to associate with national races in the United States. Donald Trump, of course, eventually was very easily renominated by um, the Republican Party. Um, after Joe Biden's success in South Carolina on February 29th and nearly running the table on Super Tuesday in early March, March the 2nd, he was pretty much on his way to becoming um, the Democrat um, nominee. But the campaigning that would have been taking place in late spring and early summer, the president's rallies, the greatest events that um, um, he stages in working his supporters up for a race did not occur. Joe Biden has been literally in his basement in Wilmington, Delaware, sending out tweets, making videos. Um, he's made some appearances throughout July. He'll make more in, in early August. Um, he is focused now on the Democrats convention that's going to be held or already has been held in, in mid-August. And then later towards the end of the month, the Republicans are going to have um, their convention in both Charlotte, North Carolina, and the live part where most of the speeches are going to be given are now officially going to be in Florida, in Jacksonville, in the Northeast part um, of our state. And these are truly going to be unconventional conventions, given the fact that the Democrats have already sent out um, um, instructions for delegates to not make their way to Milwaukee the place where 
a traditional convention would have been held. And you could bet that there are all kinds of videographers and Zoom um, um, engineers trying to find a way to convey the feel of a convention, to try to communicate speeches that we're certainly going to hear, probably from Bernie Sanders, uh, probably from Barack Obama, maybe Michelle Obama, Jill Biden, and then of course, Joe Biden's um, acceptance speech. And we're going to see how much enthusiasm um, could be ginned up again through these more remote methods um, when the identity of Joe Biden's running mate is made public to the American people. Again, still today, as we sit here on the cusp or, or in the midst of, of, of conventions, um, not yet having occurred, we do not yet know who is going to be the running mate of a man whom, if he were elected, um, would be the oldest person to take the oath of office of President of the United States in, in our history. He's committed to a woman. We've heard that. The questions are now, which women are being considered by him? Does it have to be a, a woman of color? Um, perhaps someone like Kamala Harris or Stacey Abrams or Val Demings from Orlando in Florida, or maybe an Asian American war hero, uh, Tammy Duckworth, the senator from Illinois, whose stock has seemed to rise in, in many quarters um, over, over the past few weeks. Now, when the Republicans meet, and that'll be at the, the end of August, or maybe they're meeting as you're watching this, their hope was to use um, an auditorium in Florida as a place where a traditional convention gathering could take place. No social distancing, six feet apart. Hopefully, nobody wearing masks and instead give the president the type of forum in which in the past he's thrived within. Live audiences, cheering, rousing, interrupting his speeches um, with applause. Um, until recently, um, the Republicans believed that Florida was a state that had escaped um, the wrath of COVID-19 until of course the numbers in our states began to rise significantly. So might they do an outdoor set of speeches where people might be able to space, I think in a minor league baseball stadium in, in Jacksonville, which is under consideration? Will they flaunt many of the rules and instead gather within this auditorium in, in Jacksonville to give a speech of the type the president is most comfortable delivering or might things reach a point in Florida where much of the Republican convention has to somehow be delivered and presented on video? You know, we've seen in, in, in recent election cycles, conventions become really boring events. You know, no more gavel to gavel coverage as occurred one or two um, generations ago. Um, it is going to be a challenge for myself, and maybe it's already been a challenge for many of you, to watch you know, these multi-screen presentations coming from candidates and maybe focusing on small gatherings of masked, socially distanced Democrats and Republicans in various parts of, of the country. But once that ends, once we come to the beginning of September, the race begins. Three debates are scheduled, including a fourth, which will uh, be between Vice President Pence, who we presume is going to be President Trump's running mate as he seeks a second term, and whomever Joe Biden selects as, as his running mate. Next month, we are going to look at the Electoral College. We're gonna do part of this in October as well. The system created in the Constitution to elect our president.
So I, I want to make sure that everyone prior to viewing our lecture in September gets a hold of the handout that I am producing and should be distributed to all of you because it is going to be a great reference in making each and every one of us electoral college experts once again being able to answer questions about the vagaries of a system created in 1787 to friends, neighbors, children, and grandchildren. And remember, as we've already noted in previous months, when we go vote on November the 3rd, what essentially is going to be taking place are 51 separate winner-take-all elections. We'll talk about how Nebraska and Maine, two smaller states population-wise, award their electoral votes a little differently. But in every other state and in the District of Columbia, I think it's still called the District of Columbia, by the way, um, we're going to see that the candidate who wins the most votes in a state or in D.C. wins all of that state's predetermined number of electoral votes. The general rule, the greater a state's population, the more electoral votes that state has um, when we elect our president. So already we can identify a large number of states that through history, um, through demographics, through polling, we can very comfortably put in the Biden column and into the Trump column because it's really the blue column or the red column. And they just happen to be the nominees of these two parties this time around. So off the top of my head, I'm going to predict that on election day, President Trump is going to win Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, uh, Missouri, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, um, Georgia, South Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia. I don't have a crystal ball. Kreskin hasn't, you know, whispered in my ear. But these are the way these very predictable states tend to vote in presidential elections. I could also say, I think with almost as much certainty, that on election day, Joe Biden is going to win California, Washington, Oregon, Illinois, um, most of Maine, we'll get to that later, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Virginia. You Virginians out there know that your state has undergone a tremendous political realignment. It is now considered a reliably, or one of the more reliably, um, blue states. So what are left behind are those handful of states, swing states, purple states, whose population and demographics and recent voting habits are not as reliable as some of the others. And, and we know the, the usual suspects as far as classical, traditional swing states. Florida, the biggest of all, 29 electoral votes up for grabs. Ohio, um, New Hampshire, Iowa, North Carolina, um, very much up for play. We know that until 2016, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin had voted for Democrats all the way back into the 1980s. But we know that in winning those three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and their collective 46 electoral votes, Donald Trump won the presidency, putting him over the magic number of 270. So these three states 
are now suddenly places where a lot of campaign money, a lot of campaign time, a lot of surrogates and candidate appearances are going to occur. And they might in fact be the three states that determine who wins a, a very um, close race. Florida, always a very close state. Um, Ohio went for Donald Trump by a considerable margin four years ago. Um, is it going to be really in play this year? It's a fact that no Republican has ever won the presidency without winning the very critical state of Ohio. So we'll watch that as well. Now, both parties and candidates have wish lists. We're going to expand the map. We're going to turn these more bluish states red, or we're going to turn some of these reddish states or more reddish states blue. The Trump campaign has um, believed that it might be able to turn a state like Minnesota to the red column. It hopes to win in New Hampshire. Um, it has its eyes on New Mexico, a recently blue voting state. Democrats, on the other hand, are looking to the South, to the Sun Belt, and believe that their nominee, Joe Biden, might be able to turn a state like Georgia or like Arizona, traditionally red voting to blue. These states are undergoing rapid demographic change. Lots of people from other parts of the country moving to live in the Sun Belt. And of course, the great fevered, hallucinogenic dream of every Democratic political consultant is winning Texas and turning Texas blue. Talk that the Biden campaign is going to run in Texas and run commercials in Texas. Again, Texas probably more than any other state being affected by the rapid change in demographics. Lots of people moving from outside the Lone Star State to live in Texas and in particular in cities like Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and their suburbs. So we'll watch this. And once again, if you like this stuff, and if you want to follow the progress of the race, and the progress of the race state by state by state by state, remember the two websites that I mentioned in our last lecture, and I think were on the handout in our last lecture, 538.com, total number of electoral votes up for grabs in an American presidential election, and realclearpolitics.com. Remember, they aggregate polls. They take polls that they believe have credible statistical models, accumulate them, and then keep running averages of which candidate is leading the other nationally, and I think more importantly for our purposes, state by state by state by state. You may have a senatorial election on the ballot in your state. I'm a Floridian, we do not. But there will be 35 Senate seats up for grabs this year, and um, Republicans are defending of those 35, I think 23 of them maybe 25, a little more perhaps. So w last time in 2016, it's important to note that in every senatorial race on the ballot, the Senate seat was won by the candidate of the party who won the presidential vote in that state. So every Senate seat on the ballot that Donald Trump won um, in, in a state was won by the Republican nominee. Um, every Senate seat on the ballot that Hillary Clinton won was won by the Democratic nominee. Is this going to be a, a similar phenomenon for us to watch? More about that later. Now, we've talked throughout the year about what might be 
the dominant issues. We know that Americans, when they decide for which candidate they are going to vote, if they are truly independent, unaligned, up for grabs regarding the affections of one candidate or another, in, in the voting sense, I say affections, um, they usually will identify several issues, can't be bothered with too many issues, that caused them to make the choice that we did. Sometimes it's foreign policy. In a normal election year, China and the China tariffs and China's aggressive economic actions and military actions might have been an important issue. China might come into the race for, for different reasons. Um, we might have talked about debt and taxes. We might have heard a lot about immigration. A big issue four years ago, immigration is an issue beginning this year that we thought we were going to hear a lot. But again, because of the events that began to transpire in February and March and April, the emergence of the coronavirus, um, the um, lethality of COVID-19, that tended to take up a lot of the political oxygen that was out there um, for examining different issues and drive us to, again, look at health care. The issue, by the way, that in the midterm elections of 2018, midterms, of course, taking place in between presidential elections, no presidential um, race on the ballot, in exit polls, voters identified health care as the issue that most relied on or um, were concerned about when they went into their polling uh, booth to, to cast their ballot. So health care, of course, is, is a standalone issue, but because of the COVID challenges, um, it is again very much um, in, in, the public, in the public eye. Um, we've seen since March a, a systematic change in, in the way we all live. Um, we saw, of course, the American workforce for a time contract as week after week after week, states closing down, trying to smother the virus by Americans not interacting very much with each other, caused, of course, great amounts of unemployment that required Congress to come together um, to pass bills to help sustain American families during this period of time. We saw the economy shrink um, in terms of GDP, in manufacturing, um, in economic output. We've seen the stock market on a roller coaster ride for a period of time, up and down, up and down. We've seen consumer spending, the greatest driver of the American economy, collapse, causing such venerable brands in the United States as Neiman Marcus, J. Crew, Pier One, Brooks Brothers. Hurts to all seek the safe harbor of Chapter 11 bankruptcy to try to sustain themselves into the future. And of course, we've seen COVID create tremendous strains on our healthcare system. Number one, how do you manufacture very rapidly reliable tests that can discern? when individuals have this ailment and, and when they should be perhaps isolated from those who do not. All of a sudden, the word PPE, personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, um, um, plexiglass masks, these types of masks, were in short supply as hospitals all around the country um, attempted to stockpile them, initially to protect their healthcare workers, but eventually to try to protect the general public more broadly. Complicated medical equipment, the ventilator, or as Governor Cuomo from New York called it, the ventilator. 
suddenly was in short supply, the president having to order corporations to begin mass producing these life-saving um, medical uh, devices for those who became very ill. To try to figure out what might be the longer term effects of someone who has made it through the COVID, they survived it. Might there be pulmonary or coronary or neurological effects of having this disease? We don't really know. And of course, the race to try to develop therapeutics, some types of medicines, maybe they already exist, maybe they are being developed to alleviate the symptoms of COVID-19 until of course the great and greatly anticipated vaccine to provide some measure of resistance from it can be developed. Now, these factors and many more have placed, of course, significant strains on, on the American healthcare um, system. Now, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of this wondering, are there going to be enough hospital beds, enough ICU units? On June the 26th, as a deadline was ticking, um, President Trump, um, through the Attorney General, through the Solicitor General, filed a brief with the United States Supreme Court, siding with states like Florida and Texas and Oklahoma, asking the court to completely invalidate the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, an act of Congress, which if you recall, became law on a strictly party line Democratic vote in 2010, the Affordable Care Act, um, by which 23 million Americans currently are able to acquire health insurance, and a place to which many recently unemployed Americans, laid off Americans, furloughed Americans who had been receiving their health care coverage through employer provided plans are now seeking to enter to see them through um, these long periods of, of unemployment. So Obamacare, 10 years, part of our national debate um, on the chopping block perhaps by the Supreme Court next year, but yet again, indicative of how healthcare, healthcare, healthcare is a large underlying part of um, this debate. Um, one of the notable aspects of the Affordable Care Act is that it requires every health insurance country in the United States to treat pre-existing illnesses. About 130 million Americans are thought to have some pre-existing condition. It could be diabetes, it could be elevated cholesterol, it might be obesity. And health insurance companies cannot exclude those pre-existing conditions in health policies stole, sold um, within the United States. So why do we call this the great health care conundrum? Why do we look at this issue? And again, oftentimes, depending on our political disposition, are we on the left of center side or the, the right of center side, there doesn't seem to be any common ground um, to deal with, again, this issue of affordable health care for um, America's citizens. So how does this is the question. The United States, the world's richest country by just about any measure, provide affordable health care to a greater percentage of our citizenry, while at the same time containing the fast growing cost inflation associated with health care 
and, and prescription drugs, but not diminishing the availability or the quality of care to those who are currently receiving those very good services. And, and that indeed has come to be a, a great conundrum in, in our American political discourse. The solution, it turns out, is a very complicated one. Um, some of them, as we're going to see, are, are sort of American-based um, challenges regarding universality and one-size-fits-all and, and, and an American disdain for some top-down program on just about anything, if you think about it. We don't like being told what to do, and a lot of us particularly don't like being told what to do from the federal government and, and from Washington, D.C., but here are some of the numbers. In 2018, the United States spent $3.5 trillion on health care, an average of a little more than $8,500 for each of the 330 million or so um, Americans who live in our country. $8,500 compared to the average among countries in the OECD, sounds like a uh, psychological ailment, but it's the Organization for Economic um, Cooperation and Development, the club of rich countries around the world, as The Economist magazine calls it, these countries spend an average of $3,322 a year on health care for their citizens. The share of America's GDP, the total output of goods and services in the United States, devoted to health care has risen from 7.2% of GDP, GDP back in 1970 to 18% of America's GDP in 2017, almost a fifth of our GDP. Healthcare costs, in addition, have grown at a rate of 2.4% faster than GDP growth on average since 1970. As our GDP grows, our healthcare costs grow at a higher pace than does GDP. On top of that, health care is something that is often devoted, expensive health care, to just a small part of our population. Half of health care spending, half of health care spending in the United States is used to treat just 5% of the American population, the, the 5% of, of the sickest, perhaps most chronically ill, Americans. 10% um, of our population, 10%, the sickest 10%, receives 65% of our health care spending. And it goes on to where the sickest half of our population, the 50% the most in need of health care, have 97% of all health care spending devoted to them. So it's very much a, a, a process of, of recognizing who's ill and who needs this help. Now, although only 10% of our healthcare expenditures currently are directed towards prescription drugs, we've seen, of course, the wonders of modern medicine. The idea that we now have available so many different medicines that can control maladies that a generation or two ago were terminal, were death sentences for so many Americans, people around the world. These drugs are wondrous, but the costs have risen at a, at a pace of more than 155% from 2000 to 2017. So if you look at our 
g- national spending as, as a giant pizza with different slices, defense, entitlement programs, health care. Health care already takes up a, a large slice of, of that pizza pie of American spending, but because it grows faster than does our GDP, the piece of the pie becomes larger and larger and larger um, each year. On top of all of this, there are still in the United States approximately 9% of our population that have no health care coverage at all. Insurance, Obamacare, Medicaid, CHIP, VA, none. And that, of course, is, is a challenge for a country as large as ours, but a, co- a country as affluent as ours um, as well. Now, we look throughout the developed world and see that many countries have created um, programs which, again, are universal or comprehensive in nature, meaning that these systems purport to cover every citizen, in some countries, every resident, in many countries, tourists, visitors who happen to become sick while traveling through one of these countries. Everyone probably knows someone who's been in Europe, who fell and broke a leg or had chest pains, went to a hospital, was treated, kept on asking for the bill, who do I pay, or frequently are told, you don't have to pay anyone. This is something, again, that is provided in a comprehensive, universal fashion um, in these countries. Many of these programs, of course, are run by the government. They're funded by the government through the collection of taxes, in some cases, taxes at higher rates than those that we in the United States are, are used to paying. Um, um, and most of these programs have few, if, if any, out-of-pocket costs. Generally, um, very um, necessary um, pharmaceuticals, much cheaper in other countries um, than they are in the United States, Canada, of course, being, being a great example. Now, some of these programs aren't that good. And in many cases, citizens have a hard time receiving the care they need, particularly for more elective quality of life procedures. Some are pretty good. And in a bit, we're going to talk about how some countries with smaller populations than ours actually do a very good job in in comprehensively and and universally meeting the health care needs of of their citizens. The point being that these universal plans and these comprehensive plans are not panaceas. They are not uh, cure-alls. There are trade-offs involved, and we'll talk about some of them um, as we get a little deeper into our presentation, and we'll recognize that a lot of these trade-offs are things that we as Americans generally are not willing to to accept as the cost for... um, In 1900, American life expectancy was 47 years old, meaning that if you contracted diphtheria, cholera, um, pneumonia, God forbid, you were often facing a death sentence. Slums and cities all around the world were places where communicable diseases wreaked havoc on a population. In World War I, one of the generally accepted numbers of troops who died on the field of battle was 10 million, and it's estimated that about half of that 10 million, 5 million, died from infections to sometimes minor cuts or ailments that could not be treated with medicines of the time. So we recognize that there's been a great burst forward in medical science and research and development that has really taken part 
only in the second or so half of the 20th century. One of the great stories coming out of America's response to our involvement in World War II and a country gearing up to go into a world war was a project that brought together thousands of scientists, doctors, farmers, in order to produce something that was thought to be very essential to the United States and its allies winning the war. It wasn't the Manhattan Project. It wasn't the building of atomic bombs, which of course played a big role in ending the war. We're talking instead of efforts in 1942 and 1943 to take a mysterious substance extracted from mold called penicillin, of which two tablespoons existed in 1942, worked remarkably against pneumonia and other infections. The great challenge was to find ways to ramp up rapidly the production of penicillin. And one of the great stories of America at home in World War II was the fact that by the time D-Day came along, January, nine, I'm sorry, June 1944, more than a billion doses of penicillin had been made and were available to help treat ailments, wounds, that otherwise previously would have killed um, uh, American troops. So we've seen incredible progress in these areas. In many of your lifetimes, um, in your lifetimes maybe, in, in, in many of um, your lifetimes, you've seen the doctor sort of evolve from the country doctor, the man who might have had his office in his home because he visited people in their homes, um, sometimes taking per payment a dozen eggs or a chicken or a ham. We've seen the doctor evolve now into the highly trained, highly specialized physician, able to cater and to minister to all types of different ailments. Um, through the use of surgery and sometimes non-invasive um, treatments that simply not, did not exist four or five decades ago. We've seen the hospital, a place that I remember my grandmother and my aunts shuddering when the word hospital was mentioned, not wanting to visit, not wanting to be admitted to a hospital because for a very long time, at least in their paranoid Sicilian minds, hospitals were places where people went to die. You checked in, but you don't check out. All of a sudden, through funding from the federal government, from state governments, from enormous gifts of philanthropy, we've seen hospitals become now, in many cases, these highly specialized campuses with pavilions, dealing again, sometimes very specifically, with heart, cancer, neurological ailments. And of course, we recognize that in Florida, in Texas, in New York, in California, um, in Virginia, um, these facilities are located all around um, the country. Um, hospitals, again, these, these magnificent places where very sick people come out repaired, whole, cured. We've seen, of course, medicine evolve. In the old days, you know, um, you have an ache, go take an aspirin. Your stomach hurts, you know, take a laxative. Um, very rudimentary treatments. All of a sudden, we've seen 
And make no mistake about it, the profit motive, the capitalistic instincts of pharmaceutical companies have led to the development of drugs that quite simply were unimaginable 40 or 50 years ago. Um, we see, of course, that there are now drugs that individuals could take to deal with um, of, um, infirmities, ailments, that would have been a death sentence 40 or 50 years ago. Cholesterol, under control. Diabetes, under control. Um, all kinds of vascular um, ailments, under control. We recognize that there's been a lot of insight and a lot of knowledge regarding the brain and neurology, not just brain surgery, but medications that are able to alleviate some of the psychological suffering that people have had to deal with for, for centuries. We've seen, you know, the male libido, that very fragile part of the male mind get a lot of attention in the last couple of decades. Um, I, when my kids were younger, used to make them sit around uh, the TV with me as I scanned cable news channels trying to watch all the different takes on all the important news of the day, but had to do so very guardedly. You know, a commercial would come on, a middle-aged man, his middle-aged wife, walking through a room, their shoulders brush, all of a sudden he's leering at her lasciviously and bam, before you know it, they're laying in two bathtubs by a lake and your kids are saying, why are they in the bathtubs? And you have to say, be quiet and do your homework. You don't understand this kind of stuff. So we've seen a lot of, a lot of medical attention um, and pharmaceutical attention um, directed in that case as well. And of course, we've seen the emergence of biomedical engineering and the idea that all of a sudden bad hips, knees, shoulders, other limbs can be replaced. And all of a sudden, again, a very physical, high quality of life maintained. Surgery, surgeons, no longer limited to trying to repair a broken limb or some crude surgery um, regarding hearts can now do not just old cut them up and operate, but all types of arthroscopic methods to, and laparoscopic methods to make the surgical experience one that is more easily um, tolerated. Um, I have friends that are now on their second set of hips. <laughs> Having worn out you know, one set of artificial hips, they've now had a second set um, retransplanted. Re Speaking of transplants, um, we recognize that today a bad heart, lungs, um, kidneys, um, can now be replaced through the miracle of transplantation. And of course we recognize, I could say that word I think, can't I? There are lots and lots of surgeons that specialize in the transplanting of organs. Again, to not only extend life, but to extend an enviable quality of life. And who knows what the future holds the human genome has been sequenced. The secrets of DNA are now being discerned. There are already for some maladies, treatments being fashioned to deal with the specific um, genetic dispositions of patients. Um, the future looks very bright, but again, affordability and access is something that is still very much a challenge. And again, all of these events have occurred, generally speaking, over just the last five or six decades, since the end of the Second World War, if we want to speak very generally. And again, the effect 
hasn't just been to extend life expectancy on average now into the 80s, but to make those very long lives, high quality lives as well. And that of course is, is the beauty of the advances in, in medical science. So in countries with universal systems, it's not unusual to see that in many cases, these very expensive treatments and procedures and protocols are not as easily and readily available as they are to patients in the United States who generally can either pay for it out of pocket, which isn't the norm, but have insurance that will cover these costs. Um, they use words like the prioritization and triaging of those needing these expensive time-consuming um, surgeries or treatments, but many call it rationing because in a system that purports to cover everyone, people often have to get in line to wait to receive those treatments. And we see in many of those systems, panels, not death panels, but panels creating protocols which often deny certain types of surgeries, certain types of treatments, certain types of implantation of devices to those who may be terminally ill, who may be beyond a certain age, because there is only so many who can be treated. And again, these rules sometimes put individuals on paths where perhaps life-saving or life-extending services um, might be denied. I remember back um, during the debate regarding the Affordable Care Act, for example, um, if you remember when um, the race was almost near the end, it, it turns out that Barack Obama's grandmother, who had played a significant role in, in raising him in Hawaii, you may recall was terminally ill during his um, campaign in 2008. Um, so ill, in fact, that um, candidate Obama suspended his um, run for a period of time in order to go back to Hawaii to visit her. And, and she subsequently ended up dying a few weeks before her grandson was um, elected president. During the debate regarding the Affordable Care Act and introducing that concept of, of health care coverage to the American people, I remember President Obama um, remarking that when he went to visit his grandmother, he was surprised to find out that even though she had been given such a short prognosis of, of uh, how long she was going to live, she had fallen and broken her hip and as was her right as an American covered by Medicare, it turns out, received a hip replacement only to die several weeks later. So these are the types of events that in countries with universal systems, managed systems, um, one size fit all systems, individuals in her circumstances would have been given palliative care, she would have been comfortable and not in pain, but not have been given an expensive forty dollars or $50,000 hip replacement because I suspect the cost-benefit analysis of lifespan would have caused these various systems to deny that surgery to her. Now, we know that in a very fundamental way, Americans, in, in our DNA almost, are, are different. I remember having heard that story and thinking to myself, I want my hip because I didn't care how long I might have had. I wanted my hip. I wanted to walk. And again, it's something that, that again, is less ingrained than, than it is in these countries with these, with these universal systems. We are a large country, geographically, a large population. But, you know, at 244 years old, we are a relatively um, young country. For most of our country's history, we, we recognize that by virtue of the Constitution, 
Ours was very much a federal system of governing. And for a very long time, certainly into the 20th century, when citizens interacted with government, that government tended to be a local government or maybe a state government, but it was much less likely that they were going to have to deal with one single federal government, as we now recognize is, is um, much more the norm. So going and developing and evolving into eventually 50 states, um, we recognize that Americans came to value and in many cases need to be reliant, resilient, um, 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 self-sufficient, personally responsible, individualistic, and always as a country and as Americans, this is not anything, of course, that we should be ashamed of. We are a country that economically very much was a capitalist country and, and thrived throughout a lot of our history uh, because of the blessings, if that's the right word, uh, of a free market and, and a more capitalistic system. So anytime the word, again, universal, um, one size fits all, comprehensive is mentioned, it begins to sound to more and more Americans like something socialistic. And by virtue, of course, of our national um, um, abhorrence and certainly spending much of the last century dealing with the manifestations of socialism in, in more communist states, um, words that do not resonate very well among the American population. You know, ask Bernie Sanders. Um, I suspect um, Donald Trump would, would much rather be running against someone that he could brand a leftist than a communist today in the form of Bernie Sanders, because again, it's something that I think is a particularly um, um, American phenomenon in our in our DNA, part of our um, national ethos. In addition, as a country, we have been very fortunate in, in one respect, and that is the last time that a significant conflict was fought within the United States was more than 150 years ago during the Civil War. You might have heard about that conflict recently, but it was a horrible four-year period in which perhaps 800,000 Americans in a country then of just about 30 million lost their lives. So not only were soldiers and armies um, affected by this conflict, cities, civilians, and, and infrastructure, railroads and the like, um, were often destroyed as war was waged in the United States. Now, fortunately, and, and I think that is, is the right word, um, we have never since had to deal with the concept of total war being waged um, upon our soil. And we're able again to remain this more loosely um, 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 connected federation of states than a top-down, one-size-fits-all, Washington determines, you know, lots of things, um, society. That is until, of course, the 1930s, the arrival of Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal as a prescription to deal with the Great Depression, and all of a sudden, the emergence of Washington the federal government, federal monies, federal programs, as the answer to a lot of our economic woes at the time. And then, of course, by the late 1930s, and certainly after our entry into World War II, one of the things that the national government, the federal government, and the president has a constitutional responsibility to do is to declare war, and as commander-in-chief, the president has a responsibility to prosecute that war. So we recognize that during the war years, there was a much greater presence coming from the Capitol, from the War Department, and other federal agencies um, regarding 
winning um, that conflict. So World War II um, comes to an end, and all around the world, among our allies and our foes, devastation and havoc was um, the norm. Um, the places where the war was fought, particularly in Europe and parts of Asia, were places, of course, where armies were decimated and devastated, but unlike the United States, we saw in those countries great havoc wreaked on institutions and on infrastructure. So transportation, schools, housing, hospitals, um, private business and industry as they existed were ravaged during this conflict. So as World War II comes to an end, much of the rest of the world, including those countries which were our allies, like Britain and France and Belgium and the Netherlands, and adversaries like Germany and Italy and Japan, would begin a very long process of rebuilding their governments, but also rebuilding their infrastructure and their institutions. And it's a matter of fact that for a very long time following the end of the war, with a lot of aid, a lot of sacrifice, these countries rebuilt themselves and rebuilt and implemented new types of social contracts, relationships between their post-World War II governments and their individual citizens. Many of these social contracts were based upon the reality that from the late 40s into the 50s and even into the 1960s, there was a responsibility that government create a lot of jobs and employ a lot of people. There was a responsibility that if people were going to be educated, if they were going to have higher education, in an absence of an ability for average citizens to pay, the government was expected to foot the bill for a lot of these educations. Housing suddenly was in short supply. Governments began building hundreds of thousands of government-provided and subsidized housing units. Older people, people without marketable skills, were destitute. Out of necessity, these countries began to build um, more broad safety nets to provide those without with what they needed in order to live their lives. And in the case of medical care, particularly at a time when there were new discoveries, great advances, lots of it coming from Europe, lots of it coming from Asia, only the government could build and maintain and bear the costs of providing their citizens with health care. In short, most of these countries post-World War II developed systems of governance that we call today democratic socialist countries. The definition reflecting the fact that in just about all of these countries, the leaders are fairly elected, honest elections. The votes are honestly counted. But once in office, these individuals have a responsibility of overseeing a system that is highly steeped in aspects of socialism. More heavily taxed workers finding these taxes being used to maintain again the programs that initially the government and only the government could do regarding education and housing and health care. But eventually citizens became comfortable, became um, expecting, believed as an entitlement that these were benefits that in perpetuity their governments were going to provide to them. So as a result, um, 
we would see as the United States again post-World War II was entering a period of tremendous economic growth, um, full employment, um, the rising um, value of a dollar, we could continue to move on as this more self-reliant, personally responsible, individualistic um, country, while these hybrid systems, democratic socialism, required more on the collective efforts of the government through the collection of taxes to give to citizens things that they began to believe they were entitled. France, Britain, Germany, Italy, Austria, Belgium, Japan, um, Canada adopted a more broad um, socialistic system regarding benefits for their citizenry. A brand new country like Israel comes into existence. And again, as part of its basic law and laws that followed began guaranteeing more of these necessities of life by the government to their own um, um, citizenry. So we would find that following the end of the war, a significant fork in the road would sort of emerge regarding the United States um, in many areas, but for our purposes, healthcare, um, resisting this universal, single payer, one size fits all philosophy, while we would see other models emerge um, around the world that again looked at healthcare in, in different ways. Again, often universally covered by the government and some government program. And in many countries, the right to health care came to be viewed as, you know, one of the rights of citizenship um, in, in, again, these, these different places. So we would watch, um, usually in the United States from, from afar, as these different systems came into being. Um, throughout the rest of, of the democratized world. Um, in 1945, following the defeat and the surrender of Germany, May 8, 1945, VE Day, Britain began preparing for what were going to be their first parliamentary elections since the war began for them in 1939. Winston Churchill, the leader of the Conservative Party, the Tory Party in Great Britain, the man that had sustained Britain um, through the darkest days of, of the Second World War, led the Conservatives in seeking a mandate to continue to govern their country through the remainder of the war and then during the post-war period, while the Labour Party, led by Clement Attlee, came along and ran on a platform basically saying the war is over, the British people have persevered, Britain has been destroyed, elect us and we will initiate a process of building new homes, new apartments, rebuilding schools, and guaranteeing to every British citizen health care provided by a um, part of the British government. So Winston Churchill, in July of 1945, after all the votes were counted, finds out that he and the conservatives had been voted out of office. And soon, Clement Attlee, the leader of the Labour Party in Great Britain, becomes its prime minister. And very quickly, um, the so-called beverage system a model for national health care that had been put forward during the campaign becomes implemented throughout Great Britain. The beverage model created what in Britain is known as the National Health Service, the NHS, which guarantees health care 
to every British citizen, every resident in Britain, every visitor in Britain, by virtue of the collection of taxes and the maintenance of a system, which very much is looked at like a bus system, like a library system, like anything else the government had to do, one responsibility was to maintain this national health service. Patients don't receive a bill when um, they are treated under the National Health Service. Um, the costs are very low. There is lots of prioritizing and, and lots of rationing. And under this British model, every doctor, every nurse, every therapist, every pharmacist, every pharmacy, every hospital, every clinic is either employed by or owned by directly the British National Health Service. One of the models that emerged in, in the wake of the Second World War, again, universal coverage for all citizens. Now, already in Germany, as far back as the 1880s, following um, Otto von Bismarck's successful unification to create the modern German state, there had been an experimentation with the creation of a welfare state with a broader social safety net for all of these now commonly um, German um, people. West Germany, that existed until, of course, 1989 and the fall of, of the Berlin Wall and the beginning of the reunification of Germany, embraced the use of not-for-profit insurance companies. They still exist. They're called um, sickness funds who are not-for-profit and are financed by both contributions from employers and contributions from employees via payroll deduction. Everyone has to be covered under what are now about 240 of these sickness funds, insurance funds, not for profit. Um, doctors, hospitals are private, privately owned, privately run. They are compensated from one of these 200 or 40 or so sickness funds, insurance companies of sorts, when individuals are ill, and those unable to pay their premiums, those who are not employed, um, those who are destitute, has their premiums paid by some part of the German government directly so that they participate again in one of these sickness funds. Um, countries like France and Belgium, the Netherlands, Japan, um, and lots of countries in Latin America utilize this, this same model, again, sort of like an insurance model, a sickness fund, but run on a not-for-profit basis. Now, following the end of the Second World War, Canada embraced a model that's sort of a hybrid of, of the two that we've just talked about, the British system and, and the German um, insurance system, by creating um, national health insurance. In Canada, the program that provides health care coverage to all Canadians is known, again, confusingly to Americans, as Medicare. Medicare in Canada is a so-called single-payer system, meaning that doctors and therapists and hospitals and pharmacies and pharmacists are all privately owned, they're privately run, but they know by virtue of the Canadian government being the single payer for all health care costs, what they're going to be paid for every procedure, for every surgery, um, which are negotiated and often set by government fiat, 
and they know what prescription drugs are going to cost because the Canadian government negotiates lower costs with drug manufacturers as they are the single payer as citizens um, receive them. So in these systems, healthcare givers, doctors, hospitals, surgeons, pharmacies, they know what they're going to be paid for the services rendered, and they know that they are going to be compensated by a single payer, that part of the Canadian government responsible for um, implementing this plan. Uh, a plan like this tends to be cheaper, simpler. We know a lot of Americans are buying drugs from Canadian-based pharmacies. But again, there are challenges sometimes with the prioritization of patients, particularly regarding um, um, more emergency-type treatments and even more so for elective-type surgeries that the government might cover, but may take some time for a slot to open up for an individual to be, to be treated. Um, in much of the rest uh, of the world, the, the undeveloped world, um, there are about 160 countries that do not have systems that purport to uni universally cover all their citizenry and in fact have some very spotty and, and very sketchy ways of providing insurance to those who might be able to, to afford it. Um, we look again to much of the, the undeveloped world and recognize that in parts of India, in China, um, parts of Africa, parts of um, um, South America, hundreds of millions of, of citizens live under a so-called out-of-pocket model. If you could afford to, afford to pay for a doctor's visit, a hospital stay, a medicine, you could have it. If you could barter a chicken or a cow or some service, you can get it. But if you don't, you may not receive that service. You may have some local healer or some folk remedy to deal with rather than the blessings and, and the benefits of of modern um, healthcare. So we've watched for 70 years as these different models have emerged. From time to time, we as a country have debated whether or not we should take a stab at creating some universal system of coverage um, for our own citizenry, but find, of course, that in a two-party system, particularly in the recent past, it's very difficult to find any centrality, any universality of opinion um, regarding um, guaranteeing to more Americans affordable health care. But we have, in some areas, mimicked what these other countries have done. Following the end of the Second World War, um, the Veterans Administration would take on the task of guaranteeing health care to anyone who served in the United States military. And today, of course, the VA helps meet the needs of tens of millions of American veterans. They do so in a system that very much like the British National Health Service sees all VA hospitals, all clinics, all pharmacies, all therapies, all therapists as employees of the United States government through the Veterans Administration. And again, this is one sector of our population, veterans, who are treated um, under a system very much like that in existence in, in Great Britain under the VA. In 1964, after several years of rancorous debate, accusations of the United States embracing socialism, Congress created Medicare, a single-payer health care system. Um, when an individual reaches the age of 65, 
in some cases even younger if they are disabled, they will be eligible for coverage under the United States government's Medicare system. Every doctor, every hospital, every pharmacy um, that treats patients um, on Medicare know the schedule of fees they're going to be paid. They know the reimbursement rate they're going to collect. Um, sometimes recently we've seen, of course, co-payments and different parts of Medicare um, cover uh, parts of the coverage that aren't completely paid by um, Medicare. But every provider of Medicare knows that a single payer, the entities responsible for paying uh, Medicare, are going to pay for the costs provided there. Now. Following the end of the Second World War, as we saw this great growth in, in the United States um, economy, industry thrived, cities and then suburbs began to boom, we recognized that in our country we were reaching a, part, a point of full employment. And we lived in a time where employers were very anxious to retain those employees who had been loyal and productive for them. So only after the Second World War did fringe benefits begin to emerge uh, more completely uh, across the employment sector in the United States. Paid vacation, defined benefit pensions, inducements to keep good workers working for you came into existence. And eventually, another of those fringe benefits became employers at first providing health care coverage for employees and their families to the present circumstance where employers now help pay part of the premium along with employees for health care that is provided um, to workers and their families, again, very much using this, this German model, but a model that um, um, includes, of course, insurance companies that are for-profit corporations. But again, a big sector of the population covered there. So veterans have this VA. The retired Americans have Medicare. Those out there working in the um, uh, uh, American uh, workforce probably have most, hopefully, some type of insurance available to them. Now, what do you do with everyone else? Um, in 1965, Congress created Medicaid, a program that administers funds to the states to help states meet the health care needs of those who earn below some very low levels, individually or as a family. Medicaid sort of fills out the very lowest strata of wage earners in the United States. Um, under a belief that children in our country should receive health care irrespective of their parents' abilities to provide it. In the late 90s and then in the early 2000s, Congress created the CHIP program, Children's Health Insurance Program, that guarantees that every young American up to the age of 18 would be able to receive health insurance even if their parents themselves didn't have it, nor could they afford it. So we recognize that lots of different stratas of the American population um, were indeed covered in different ways, um, not in any single payer, not any universal system, but there was a recognition by the early 2000s that there were a strata of Americans who made too much money to receive Medicaid but didn't earn enough or maybe didn't work in a job where employers made the acquisition 
of health insurance possible. And it was this strata of Americans that I think are sometimes derisively referred to as the working poor that the Affordable Care Act was directed toward. And that, of course, was the piece of legislation which, when signed into law in 2010, um, initiated a decade-long debate, a great political issue, because Obamacare was socialized medicine. It required for a time everyone to have insurance or pay a penalty come tax time. Um, it required that insurance companies offer certain things with policies that they sold, including protections for pre-existing um, conditions. Um, we've seen, of course, that the favorability of the Affordable Care Act very much depended on what region of the country you lived in and your political disposition. More liberal, maybe in favor, more conservative, that looked like some government-run mandate. And, you know, if the government can't tell me to wear a mask, <laughs> I'll be darned if the government's going to make me buy um, health insurance. Great political issue. Um, four years ago, three and a half years ago, Donald Trump ran on a platform that, among other things, promised to repeal and replace Obamacare. He said it would be easy, and he said the result would be something, quote, terrific. Three and a half years later, Obamacare still under assault, um, particularly when Republicans controlled both houses of Congress, still limping along 23 million Americans receiving care through it. Um, 37 states have now expanded Medicaid eligibility to those who earn more, thus opening up a healthcare availability to some of the working poor via Medicaid. A number of states resist and still have not expanded Medicaid eligibility, in particular, Two of the three largest states in the country, Texas and Florida, have not done so. Um, just recently, Oklahoma, um, Oklahomans, in a referendum, voted to amend their constitution in order to accept the expansion of Medicaid, the raising of the eligibility ceiling so that more Oklahomans may receive it. Missouri is soon going to vote on something similar. Their legislature's not willing to do so. So the conundrum, of course, is health care. The expectations of Americans to health care um, when they want it, services that um, are always available to them, rather rapid ability to see doctors, is, is, is very much um, balanced by these other systems that other democracies around the world have, have created. Um, I suspect we're going to hear a lot about President Trump um, continuing to replace Obamacare with something better. He said he's going to guarantee that people with pre-existing conditions are going to be covered. And conversely, I think we're going to hear a lot from Democrats and about Joe Biden that this is the guy from the party that wants to take your health care away, that wants to put 130 million Americans with pre-existing conditions in a worse spot that they are now. So we're going to hear a lot about COVID over the next few months. We are now, depending on when you're watching this, three months away from Election Day. Um, but remember, a lot of the talk about COVID ultimately will involve a conversation about health care, how we receive it, and how rapidly um, we are going to be able to create the treatments and eventually the vaccine um, to do so. A, a great rush is on to, to accomplish this goal. So, as always, my deep gratitude for um, joining us. Um, 
I hope that we will be able to see each other soon as election day draws near um, in person. And remember in October, I'm sorry, in September, we are going to cover the Electoral College. So please make sure or ask perhaps if the handouts that will go along with that lecture are available because when that lecture is over, as promised, we will all be Electoral College experts. So happy August to everyone and we'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.